Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Ephesians 5, verse 1, on the top of my portion of scripture, it says, living in the light. And so we'll have a theme in this scripture about the light versus the darkness. As we read this, you'll see it. Ephesians 5.1, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no, did I, I did warn us all a few weeks ago that the latter three chapters of this book gets heavy, right? Okay. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God or the wrath or judgment of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness. For once you were like them, is what he's saying. But now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. There's a lot of good stuff to teach in here. <laughs> and so I will do my best to do that. Uh, last week, we were talking more about living as children of the light in the family of God. So the family of God, how we should uh, live as Christ would want us to live in the church, Paul now transitions and focuses on how we should live in the world as children of light. So now there is going to be this focus on this is how the world lives and this is how you should live. And Paul focuses a lot on don't live like this and give some ways that we can live. But Paul is really saying here there's a clear demarcation line in the first, uh, in the scripture last week, in chapter four, there was a line of your old nature and now your new nature because Christ has changed your life. Now he's saying there's another line as well, and that is that you are not like this world, you live in the light of Christ, and so do not be like this world. Paul is clearly making the point that there is a difference between us and the ways of this world. And that there will be a contrast. There will be a difference in this world and us. And you know what, church? We need to be okay with that. And it can be a little uncomfortable uh, when we live in this world and find that we're, we're called to live different. And Paul never shies away from teaching that. And this is what he says. So what's the difference well, the next 14 verses explain it. What's the difference? He says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. Our world doesn't imitate God in everything they do. They imitate each other. Or, you ready for this? Even the devil has influenced people to live the way he wants them to live. Instead, Paul is saying, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. That's a lot. That's going to take a lifetime to do, by the way. 
because you are his dear children. This has the picture of a, of a loving father that kids want to imitate and follow because of his love and his example. That's the picture here, that children would copy their dad, or the word here could be follow. And now it says imitate God. Paul could also say imitate Christ if he wants to, because Colossians 1 says Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. It's Colossians chapter 1. So when he says imitate God, the best way of looking at that is imitate Jesus. Follow Christ's example. How do we know what Christ was like? Well, we have authenticated, validated text, and that is the Bible. And so we follow what the Word of God says. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. Now, what's the example he gave us? Paul goes in to say, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. That's the example of the love that we should have, a sacrificial love. You know what he's talking about here? It, the view is the cross. The view is this sacrificial love of giving up your life for God and for others. Why does he say a pleasing aroma to God? Well, in the Old Testament, Levitical period or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, there was a sacrificial system practice that we get to read about a lot. And uh, when they sacrificed animals, they were grilling the animals pretty much. They were roasting meat. Now, I say this all the time, but it's still a great example. Texas Roadhouse. <laughs> and they do need to give me some stock because I guess I'm helping them grow over there and getting business every time I bring them up. But when I drive by Texas Roadhouse, I smell a sweet, pleasing aroma to my nose. And it is the smell of a roasted steak or a, a grilled steak. Anyone drive by a Burger King and all of a sudden you want a burger? Now, I'm kidding, but the point literally though is, is that when you roast meat in a sacrificial system, it was pleasing, but God wasn't talking about the smell of the meat. He was talking about the manner in which you offer that sacrifice. And Jesus offered himself in a sacrificial way that even if we didn't love him, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The word here, love, is agape love. That love means to love someone, to not let it be about you, but instead, let it be about the person you're loving, even if they're not loving you. That's a hard love to live out. Love your enemies, pray for them, bless them. Wow. And Jesus did that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We weren't loving him. He showed us agape love. Even if we didn't return the love, he loved us. He's calling us to love like that. Even if you and your spouse are upset with each other, love. Don't keep records of wrong. Love. And it's hard, especially when you're right. You know, I'm right. Now you're wrong. No. Love, that kind of love will change the world, church. That kind of love will change the world. It did. Jesus' love has changed and transformed this world. Can you imagine if Jesus did not love us that way? Wow, think about that for a moment. By the way, I've gotten quite a few wow shirts. I need to start wearing them. Uh, I've got quite a few people that printed out. Thank you for those shirts, by the way. Wow, think about that, though. If he did not operate in agape love and he operated in love that had to be given first in order for him to love us, we would be doomed. Because we, every time we loved right, then we would we'd do something wrong, then we have to love again. And it's just, remember I was talking about sin management last week? Oh, I did something right. Oh, I did something wrong. Maybe like, like could we, we could call it holiness management. It's really a religious look on things or a legalistic thing. But we don't want to do that. The reality is he loved you before you even started living for him. Can you imagine if he didn't do that, though? But that's the kind of love that we're challenged to live like. That's the kind of love that you won't find in this world. That's a contrast of light versus darkness. Let me clarify something real quick. When Paul talks about the difference between light and dark, he's talking about the kingdom of God, the good deeds of Christ, the love, okay, righteousness, truth, 
And when he talks about darkness, and even Jesus and other authors like John in 1 John, there's this analogy they use of light versus darkness, and the dark kingdom represents the kingdom of Satan and evil deeds and hate and all the evil things and wickedness in our world. And so we are the light living in a dark world, is what he's saying. And so we imitate God, we don't imitate this world. And that's what here, what Paul's talking about. And we imitate the love of Christ, not the love we see around each other. The love of Christ is our example. And it is hard to live out. Just telling you that right now. It is hard, but it's the right thing to do. It's the way we can do it. Can we do it? Yes. Why? Because Jesus lives in us. The light lives in us to live out the light. So thank God for that. So he goes from a self-sacrificial life to a self-indulgence life of the world. Notice this change. From that to this. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. You know why? It's all about self-indulgence. It's all about wickedness. And the word sexual immorality has to do with either heterosexual or homosexual sins. Premarital, extramarital, lust, uh, coveting a spouse, another spouse, uh, or a friend or a neighbor's spouse we see in the commandments. Impurity or greed. And I want to get to greed in a moment, so I'll get there. Um, this, there should be no hint of it, the NIV says. No hint of this in your life. Why would he be like, no hint? Because any is not good. <laughs> any kind of sin is not good. But the, the Ephesus church, they were in... Uh, an area, and I want to be careful because I know we have young ears here. So I'll need you to read between the lines a little bit. But they were in an area where the goddess of Artemis was worshipped, and they worshipped her um, through parties of very inappropriate things. Large groups of parties, if you can understand me. That's the context this church lives in. People, people don't even think anything wrong with what they're doing. And so Paul's in this contrast saying, have nothing to do with this. Even to the point that even their talk is perverted and wrong. So he said, don't even talk like that. Let there instead be praises and thankfulness and edifying, encouraging words about God. Don't even go down that route Instead, let your mouth be pleasing to God and be beneficial for others around you. Let it be praise and thanksgiving. That's the context they were in. It's not far from America, though, is it? Verse 5, you can be sure that no immoral, this is a major warning. He's like, remember, you're the light. Everyone who's not in Christ, they're in the world. And this is what they can be sure of. And you too, if you're not careful, if you start living in the darkness, this is a concern. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. It's interesting because the word greedy has to do with constantly lusting for more, 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 more. Never satisfied. And we, it's interesting. We just prayed about that in our altar time before this transition time. That God is enough, church. He really is. And when you've gone down this greedy path of wanting more stuff and it still doesn't satisfy. Am I right? Come on, we've been there. Make sure you have everything. And then you still find yourself wanting something new. Because Amazon ad pops up and says, you need this. You need this. You know, you don't have enough money yet. You need to do this to get it. It's just this. That is from the devil. Distracting us. Distracting us. And it's interesting because he says it's idolatry to lust and have a greed for things of this world. Why? Because it puts things of this world before God. And so here's a question. Why would someone even want the kingdom of God if all they want is everything here on earth? 
So the result of wanting everything here on earth is you're going to get that. The world is going to get what they want. They want this earth. They want, God, they want nothing to do with God. That's exactly what they're going to get. That's scary. That concerns me for my neighbors and my friends who I want them to have God's kingdom. But the devil is using greed and lust for everything in this world to distract them so they miss the kingdom of God. Their eyes are darkened, scripture says in 2 Corinthians 4. Their eyes are darkened from the truth. They're living in the dark and they're darkened by the enemy, Satan. That's concerning. And the greed, this can slip into our own lives. Greed for more. And guess what comes up? And then we have us idolatry that goes before God. You know what's interesting is the first commandment of the Ten Commandments is have no other gods before God. I think that's there on purpose, first. Because if you get the first one wrong, you get the rest of them wrong. But if you get the first one right, you get the rest of them right. In other words, you learn to keep God first, you'll experience God's love. And you'll love God and you'll be loyal. By the way, love in the Bible has less to do about selfish desires and feelings and more to do with loyalty. Loyalty. Remember, agape love isn't, isn't based on merit or what people do. It's based on just loving someone because love does that. Agape love isn't based on if someone does something for me, I'll love them. It's based on God's love to love even if they don't do anything. If we get the first one wrong, loving God and learning his love like that, learning agape love, we won't love one another as we're supposed to. We'll still, we'll kill, we'll covet. That's why the world is all out of balance. I have the answer and I'm not even a president of any country or any prime minister or, or leader. The answer, I don't have the answer. The word of God has the answer. You know what I'm saying? The Bible has been trying to tell the world for a long time. You know what I'm saying? I, I've discovered the answer a long time ago. So have you, haven't you? The world, though, has put everything, the darkness, those who live in the dark, they have put these things in front of God. The sexual immorality, the impurity, the greed, the things of this world. And so now everything is off. Everything's off balance in our world. It's a mess, isn't it? The only way is to put God first again. Put him back on the top of our lives. Worship him first. Praise God. I got to keep moving forward. I'm getting, mm. yeah, <laughs> I'm getting really behind. Here we go. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. Don't be fooled. For the anger of God or the wrath or judgment of God will fall on all who disobey him. That's the reality. For those who live in that sin, that's the pattern of their life. They don't know Christ. That is the reality for them. They will be judged and it won't be good. The end won't be good. It will be, it will be a far from God. It will not be an inheritance with God. They won't inherit the kingdom. He says, don't participate in the things these people do. Can I also say, don't just not participate, but don't dwell on those things. Don't focus on those people. Because not just by what they say excuses sins, but even how they live can start to wear on you as you're watching. As you're watching your neighbors have all this stuff or they seem like everything's happy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and everything else. Everything looks great. Man, I want to be like that. That's not always the truth, am I right? So be careful not only to be fooled by those who are trying to excuse sin, rationalize sin, justify sin. Oh, it's not bad. It's not that big of a deal. Careful of that, but also be careful staring at them and getting stuck on, maybe I should do that. Maybe I should do this. That also can fool you. Your, our eyes can get us in trouble. Hey, he, he, we've learned that that human nature, that, that old nature, it still needs to be crucified some. It, the power of it has been crucified at the cross. The power of your sinful nature, the power of sin has been dealt with. It's done. It has no power over your life. But there's still some residual effects from it that you got to stay away from. 
there's the aftermath of that sin in your life. The sinful nature sometimes just kind of gets up there and there and, and start, to, start to get greedy again. You start to lust for the things around you or covet for the things around you. Be careful. Look out for that. Let's keep going. For once you were full of darkness. Now other translations and some translations will interpret this. For once you were darkness. That's how bad we are without God. We are dark, sinful people. But now you have light from the Lord, and that light is Jesus. That light is Jesus. So live as people of light. Conform to who you really are. This is who you are, not like this world. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. That's one of my favorite lines in our sermon today. For this light, for Jesus within you produces who you're supposed to be. You don't conjure and produce that. Do you cooperate? Can you help it grow? Absolutely. The more I obey the word of God, more light, goodness, right, and truth comes out. The opposite of that is the world, and it's things that are bad and evil, wickedness, and then dishonesty and deception. But what Jesus is producing in you is not dishonesty. He's not producing wickedness in us. No, he's producing goodness, righteousness, and truth. And because he's in you, you can live this way in a dark world that doesn't have any bearings on what we're doing wrong. They have, even, they have no idea that there's a changed life that's possible to have. They have no idea. Then he says this. So this is the contrast. You know, the world doesn't carefully care or determine what God wants for them. But we do. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. That word worthless there means exactly what it is. <laughs> worthless. You think you're gaining something and you don't. It's empty. And that's about the, the deeds of darkness, the evil. Expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. Let me talk about this first, and then I'll talk about the exposing. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Basically here, that we focus on living and imitating Jesus. And as we focus on living and imitating Christ and living like him, we'll find that and we'll discern and, and really experience that everything he says is good, is righteous, and it is true. The world, though, we can do something. Humanity can do something. We can make ourselves a god. And let me explain that. We can carefully determine what pleases us. We can carefully focus on what we want. Paul is saying that's not the way we are in the light of the kingdom of God. We carefully think about what God wants. And one of the best ways of doing that is to imitate Christ, live and love like him. And as you obey the word, you will find out it is true. Pragmatically, the word of God works. It is true. So cool. Expose them. Now, this is weird. As a kid, when I would read this, even as a, as a young adult or like in high school, I would read this, and I'd be like, so I'm supposed to tell on people? I'm supposed to, like, put them on blast or, like, shout on the rooftops people's evil deeds? That just seems weird. And that's not what Paul is saying here. He's not talking about in the vein of, of openly rebuking people and actually, he doesn't really go too far into going to the world and rebuking them. You know why? Because in Proverbs in the Old Testament, we learn that it's, you need to be really careful about rebuking an unbeliever. Because the Bible says that you're a fool if you do that, because they, they don't even know what you're talking about. They don't even get, why are you rebuking or trying to correct someone who doesn't even know Christ or know the word of God? They have no idea what you're getting on them for. 
So really, that's not what he's saying here. Now, if there was a rebuke that needs to take place or correction, that would be more in the body of Christ. So what is he trying to say here? I think that's a huge question I had when I was reading this. And this is what he's advocating. He's advocating that we shine in this world, not participate with the worthless deeds. Why? Because as those who live in the dark see us live like Christ, we help expose with our living how good it is to live in the light of Christ and how worthless it is to live in darkness. In other words, when you come around them and you're living like Christ, it can expose that they're off and that there's something different about you. I was reading this to my kids and I was trying to explain this to them. I was like, how do I explain this to kids? And so I was, this was this past week for devotions. I'm just trying to break down the scripture for kids. And I was reading it and I said to my son and my daughter, I said, imagine if you go buy a snack cart at school because they have one and you decide to steal and they decide to say that's not right and walk away. What did that just do? It exposed your heart. It exposed that you're wrong, that, that you knew that you, you started questioning because they didn't want to take it and you're wondering, should I take it now? But you take it anyway. That exposed your worthless deeds, so to say, or the evil choice you made, the wrong choice you made. That's how I explained to my kids. That's what's going on here. Now, by the way, I like what Coach Lou Holtz, anyone know Lou Holtz, Coach Lou Holtz, famous football coach? He said this to his team all the time, I only have one rule, do right. Do right. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. If we focus on doing what our new nature wants us to do, what Christ wants us to do, We'll just focus on doing what's right. And when we do that, our light invariably actually starts to impact those around us when we make the right choices. And that's how I was trying to explain to my kids. He goes on to say this, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. Now, Anyone paint your house before? I, I paint, I've painted, I'm a, I would consider myself a painter. I don't have a license to paint. But I've learned a lot from my dad, my brother, and I've helped paint houses. I'm not in the painting business anymore, just so you know. Uh, but I would do paint on the side to help pay off debt and things. And one of the mistakes I made even in my own home was to paint at night. <laughs> and to not have proper lighting when I do paint. And uh, so when you're painting a white wall or painting a wall near a ceiling that's white, you know, you gotta be really careful that you're cutting in well, you know, and that line is nice. And you don't wanna hit the ceiling. The problem is if you're not painting during the daytime where the light is more natural, it's real, it's not artificial, that, that real light will help show you everything, the trim. You'll know not to hit the trim around your door frames, your baseboards. But the thing is I was painting a couple of rooms one time in light gray, like really light. And the walls were white. And my, the shadow of my big old head was getting away from the light, my hand was getting in the way. And so I had no idea I kept hitting the ceiling until the next day. And that natural, real light comes into the room and exposes all my bad spots. And that's what Christ does. Christ will shine through our lives. And by the way, Christ shined on your life one day and you felt convicted by your sin, but you found out that there is forgiveness for your sin. So you confessed it and asked for forgiveness of that sin. That's the beauty of the gospel. He doesn't just convict you. He gives you the cure for it. 
And when his light shined on you, it, it made you probably feel uh, bad. But at the same time, when you hear the full gospel, you find out that there's an answer and forgiveness for that sin. Now, the light of Christ lives in you. So when you go and live like Christ around you, it will expose evil around you or wickedness or people living in the dark. Jesus does that through you. Now, it's interesting, earlier in the first service, I thought of something, and I thought about something before I came up here, that artificial light isn't the true light of Christ. Sometimes we'll, we'll do, sometimes we'll put on a fake facade that we're holy. That's not true light. Imitate God and imitate Jesus, that is true light. It's not about you, it's about the light of Christ in you. The other thing I thought about in the first service was I was painting a white wall with gray paint. And sometimes we as Christians try to live in the gray way too much. We try to live in the gray way, we try to figure out how, how close can I get to that, that darkness before I'm in the wrong. I want to stay in the light. And next thing you know, you got this gray life blurred. The Bible calls us to live in the light. And it's not going to be easy. But the light of Christ grows in you and produces and satisfies. Yes. So much so. There's a quote here. And they believe, scholars believe that Paul was quoting a baptismal hymn of salvation. And some believe that he was calling the believers to wake up from their darkness that they're playing around with. The, the, they're, they're sleeping on God, so to say, and Jesus is around trying to wake you up. Wake up. Why? Because there's people that need to get out of the darkness. Let me illustrate that for you, and then we're going to close. We have this call from God to shine. So we're going to bring the lights down in this room. Relax. Now, after the first service, um, I think some people started falling asleep. Let's try to stay awake. But it was nice and comfy in here. This is what happens spiritually. When you go from the darkness, your old life, into your new life in Christ because of salvation, he brings you into his kingdom. Now, right now on this stage, this is representing the kingdom of God living in America. You're like this. And if I were to go anywhere around this room, that light would follow me because I'm living in the kingdom of God. Right, right now you have darkness around you, but you have the light of Christ spiritually in you too. So wherever you go, there is light of Jesus. Goodness. Righteousness and truth, as we learn from Scripture. Everywhere you go. The goal is, and Paul has a heart for the lost, the goal is, is that we're so different that people notice the light and want to come into this circle. But the problem also, and the reason why he's warning them, have nothing to do with those things, is because we can put a bowl or we can conceal our light when we start living in sin again. And you'll walk by someone who's been looking for Jesus and they don't see Jesus because you've been living in a way you shouldn't live. When, he, when they're right on the edge, they're looking. Your neighbors, your coworkers are looking and, and we forfeited light for artificial happiness, artificial light, or for darkness. The more I live like Christ and I can't do it without Jesus, only he produces that. But the more I cooperate and say, Jesus, I'm going to live for you today. I'm going to shine your light today. I'm going to be who I truly am today. Someone may get pulled into the light. And he's saying, and Christ will give you light. Not only will you wake up from your spiritual slumber, not living for God, but you'll help other people come to know Christ. That's what he's trying to say here. You can bring the lights back up before we all fall asleep. I'm just kidding. So lastly, how do we do this? How do we live 
like the light in darkness. We already learned it in verses one and two. Follow Jesus and how to love and live in this dark world. If you get a little lost in your own life of how a Christian should live, reset in Jesus every time. Every time. Because church, you, can, you can't really copy church, but you can copy Christ wherever you go. You can imitate him wherever you go. Secondly, be true to who you are in Christ. This is your true identity, Jesus in you. And do not be fooled by those living in the dark. Be careful. Be careful about staring at it. Be careful about dwelling on it. Be careful about the rationalization of sin. Paul warned us to not let that happen. He said, imitate And he said, don't be fooled. Grow in the light of Christ. Let Christ grow in you. How do you grow that light? You feed your heart the word of God. You feed your heart by being in the presence of God. You make him enough. Spend time in his word. Let his word teach you what is good, what is right, and what is truth. Now, here's the hard part about the Bible. You ready? We have to obey it. It doesn't work if you don't. It works, but we won't find out if it works or not. But it works. And here's a perfect example. You want to say something so mean to someone because they hurt you, and you just don't. You hold your tongue, and you pray, Lord, help me. Jesus, please rise up in me. Please let me shine light right now and not shine darkness. Just a, just a simple example. And lastly, don't conceal Christ in you. Let your light, your lamp, or your life, in other words, Uh, burn bright or shine bright. Let it shine. Don't conceal Christ. Don't be afraid of what everyone's going to think. Don't go down that road of sin again and worthlessness of evil deeds and darkness. Don't do that. I'm preaching to myself. Let's grow. Let's, let's, Let's live in Christ. Let's shine for him. Here's the command we got from Jesus in Matthew Five, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp, by the way, a lamp back then was like an oil lamp, so it would have burned the basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds, Christ-like deeds, in other words, shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. You know what that has to do with when you break that down? People will come to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and savior because of your good deeds in shining Christ. Just because the way you live, you not only expose how wicked darkness is and evil is and how messed up and worthless it is, you also go, you also give someone a hunger. And I think that's cool because we prayed that earlier. You give someone a hunger and thirst for the light and they'll praise God one day. Amen? Let's pray. God, first of all, thank you for transferring us from darkness into light through Christ. And Lord, we want to be more like Christ. We need Jesus to continue to grow in us and produce the goodness, righteousness, and truth of Christ. So Lord, as we live that out, will expose the worthlessness of this world, the the evil things that it does, God, the, the worthless deeds of this world, Lord, that is not going to give any full or eternal satisfaction through our lives, through our shining, through our character of Christ coming out of us, the fruit of Christ coming out of us. Lord, it would draw people in to the kingdom of God. Lord, help us to be true to who we are in this dark world. It's not easy. And God, when we're in the secret, maybe no one's around place, God, I pray we would still make the right choice, that we would do right, that we would grow in that secret place under that soil. That's where, that's where we grow. That's where your light grows. When, we're, when no one's around, and we're letting you water us and feed us under that surface, under the soil, when no one's watching in that secret place, that's where we grow. And so when we're out in public, they're gonna see that tree, that life, that light. 
Thank you, God. Help us to be faithful in private and in public for the sake of the lost. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church.